You're watching Natural Lessons with Naturalist James Anderson from the Marion County Park District. Hope you enjoy the show. And most of all, remember to go out and explore your Marion County Parks. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Natural Lessons with Naturalist James Anderson. It's already hard to believe that uh, we're already on our fifth episode. So, yes, we're hoping to uh, continue and uh, do some more. Uh, today's episode is Wildlife Tracking 101. So the format of this video is a little bit different than the uh, other videos that we have made. To kind of give you a background story of the reason why. Uh, so if you remember the last episode on episode four, when we were talking about how to identify birds by sight and sound, uh, my, uh, my microphone actually died. Um, when I, uh, I use a microphone to help narrate my voice. Uh, so it kind of helps, uh, with the slide projection. And, uh, so it was kind of funny. I used it one night, it was fine. And the next day it just, it just wouldn't work. So, uh, again, I, I had to wait some time. Luckily it came into my own all. And, uh, in the process of that, I uh, said, all right, well, I got to work on another episode, even though I won't be able to narrate my voice. So um, I decided to do the Wildlife Tracking 101 with uh, live video. Um, every once in a while, you'll see some uh, pictures. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, it's going to be uh, kind of different. I kind of did this one with uh, when I did Marion's Natural News. Uh, so I, I hope you enjoy the program. Hello, everybody. My name is James Anderson. I'm the naturalist with the Marion County Park District. And today's natural lesson is going to be about wildlife tracking 101. So we're going to be learning about what a wildlife track is, and then we're going to be talking about some different examples. Today I am at the Paradise Nature Preserve, which is our parks that we are in charge of with the Marion County Park District outside of the village of Caledonia. This park is really easy to get to. Uh, the easiest way I tell people is get on 95, like you're heading towards Mount Gilead, turn left there on 746, stay on there for about less than a mile or so, and then turn left on Marion Williamsport, go all the way down to the end, and that's where this park begins. So those are just some simple directions, um, but throughout this uh, video, we're going to be doing some live video uh, like we're doing right now. Also, too, I've had some people that have been so kind on our Facebook posts uh, that have allowed us to uh, borrow and use some of their pictures about wildlife tracking 101. So I hope you guys enjoy the program. All right, so I know right now you're looking at this table and you're saying, wow, there's a lot of weird, interesting, bizarre things. Well, guess what all of these things have in common? They're all wildlife tracks. Now we're going to define what does it mean to find a wildlife track. And this is just my own interpretation. I know there's a lot of definitions, but basically a wildlife track is a type of signs or evidence that wildlife leaves behind. So think about it in a human perspective. Think of the winter time when there's snow on the ground. A lot of us like making snow angels. So I make our snow angel, you leave, and I come upon that snow angel and I say, oh, a person has been there. So Wildlife tracking is like telling a story. They can tell us maybe how did the animal live, maybe how did it move. Uh, like badgers, badgers kind of walk kind of stocky, so you'll notice on their paw prints that they kind of have that, that weird stride. Um, maybe if we're looking at a cocktail rabbit or a bobcat situation, we can see who won, who survived, who didn't. So uh, wildlife tracks come in all different shapes and sizes. And that's why I love teaching about wildlife tracking because a lot of people just tend to think, oh, it's just uh, hoof prints, paw prints, and we only get to see it during the muddy season or the snowy season. Well, guess what? You can find it all year long and you can find it even in your own backyard. You don't have to just go to a, a state park or a national park. Again, you can find some uh, local wildlife tracks in your own, uh, again, backyard. So again, I'm hoping after today's presentation, you'll definitely learn that again, tracks come in all different shapes and sizes. So the first set of wildlife tracks I wanna talk about is the famous tracks that we mentioned earlier, the hoof prints and paw prints. 
Uh, now, just like all the other living organisms, uh, tracks come in all different shapes and sizes, like we mentioned. Uh, but also with the paw prints and hoof prints, uh, they come in a lot of unique uh, diversity. So what you're just seeing, uh, I bought this off of Amazon. There's uh, different kinds of uh, paw prints, uh, some with indents with them, and uh, some of them that's the actual shape. And uh, when you're looking at tracks like this, there's a lot of things we always have to consider. Um, obviously size, but the problem with size is uh, size can, can throw us off a little bit. If you ever played in snow or mud, what's the first thing when our foot hits the surface? What well, It slides. So unfortunately it can kind of enlarge the image, you could say. Um, so it can throw you off a bit, especially if you've got some species that are really closely uh, in, in size. But obviously a mouse to a bear, it, that's completely different. Um, but then we definitely want to look at the, uh, how the toes are arranged, uh, the, the toe pads, um, if there's any claws visible or not. Um, a lot of our canines, the, the claws are visible. Uh, but gray foxes are a great example of the canine family in Ohio that we, uh, they actually can kind of retract. Obviously cats uh, retract their claws and the only time you would only see uh, claw marks is uh, if they're about to attack something or defend themselves. So really, really pay attention to the fine detail. Um, but I'm going to show you some other examples with other people's pictures and kind of give you more little definition of uh, some of the terminology when it comes to looking at uh, paw prints, hoof prints, things like that. All right, so when we're looking at a wildlife track, especially when it comes to a lot of our mammal species. Um, what's pretty unique is they have a lot of differences to them, uh, their overall shape and size. Um, and this is just uh, some of the terminology, especially if you get into wildlife tracking, a lot of publications, a lot of books, um, they talk about some of these uh, different terms. And we, I mean, we won't talk about all of them, but what I tell people when you're looking at paw prints, uh, definitely pay attention to toes. Uh, pay attention, you know, about the spacing. Um, how big are the toes? Are they wide? Are they thin? Um, that's really important. Um, then I always tell people, look at the bottom regions around the heel pad or the heel lobes. Um, sometimes they can be very wide. Sometimes they can be very narrow. Um, things like that. But the big thing I always tell people is pay attention to claws, if claws are present or not. Because if you think about it, a lot of our felines don't really show their claws because since they're retractable, the only time you would really see a feline claw marks on, on a uh, wildlife track is if they were about to attack something, rather uh, a threat or uh, a food item or something like that. Uh, but, you know, versus, you know, your canines, you know, they, uh, their tracks uh, are their claws are usually very visible on their, their tracks. Um, but then we got some oddballs like a gray fox who their claws are kind of retractable as well. So, uh, you know, different wildlife have, have different rules. So, but yeah, just kind of pay it, pay attention to that. Uh, but this kind of goes along with the, with the slide you just saw. Um, I just found this online, but uh, overall look at the length, width, um, that's really, really going to help you. So, I mean, like we kind of talked about the one time, you know, obviously from a bear and a mouse, that, that's quite a very difference. But sometimes with some of your wildlife species that are almost about the same size, you know, sometimes that, that, can, um, that can affect what, what, what you're seeing. Um, you know, if you're looking at uh, some of your fox species, you know, a lot of times they're, they're really closely uh, related um, when it comes to their tracks. Uh, so really paying attention on that. Um, you know, how, how do they run, uh, the spread, the width, um, you know, th things like that really paying attention will really uh, help you out. Um, but then when we get to some of our bird species, you know, a lot of them look the same. Um, they they, several times they come in uh, little differences uh, like the mammals, but a lot of them look, look quite quite the same. So, you know, if you look at, at this picture, or it's, it's 17, 18, you know, that, those two look very, very similar. Uh, but again, paying attention about the toes, how spread apart, are they very close together? Is there 
um, you know, long toenails or their short toenails, you know, things like that. And then, you know, when we get clear on the other side, um, where it says 20, uh, that would be your waterfowl species. So obviously they would have webbed feet. Uh, 19, that would be, you know, some of your, uh, some of your songbirds, shorebirds, um, they would have that. So really, really pay attention um, when you're really looking at bird tracks. Again, just, just size, um, again, just the smallest detail will really help you. Um, and then when we're looking at wildlife tracks, um, you know, the front uh, foot and the rear foot are sometimes completely different. Uh, for example, this uh, on the left is the beaver. So the the front foot looks like a like a typical it almost looks like a human hand, and then on the rear foot it it's a webbed foot because obviously they're designed to swim. And then if you look on the right, um, those are squirrel. Uh, now yes, they they are uh, different, but if you're not really uh, familiar with wildlife tracking, you know sometimes they can can look the same. So just keep that in mind that again the front and the rear foot. Uh, will have differences. So you really got to pay attention with that. So here's another classic example of wildlife tracks. So these are just some common uh, bird's nests that you can find in the state of Ohio. Uh, these I, I found at Marion Tallgrass Trail. The one up here, this is a uh, Baltimore Orioles nest, probably one of the most unique nests that we have in the state of Ohio, in my opinion, because as you're looking at all this material, this bird just made with its beaks and its feet, and yet us humans, we have to use sometimes a lot of tools to, and, and use our uh, calculations and all sorts of things just to make some of the simplest objects, but yet birds barely have any of that, and yet they're able to make such um, amazing, amazing things. But um, obviously we know the, the purpose of a nest is to raise the young. Now, in some of our, our birds of prey, like bald eagles, sometimes they may rest on there year round uh, so uh, they can get away from danger or fight against the elements. So, so just like paw prints and hoof prints, um, nests are very diverse as well. Uh, we got ones that are very large, like we mentioned, like the bald eagle. Uh, the largest one, I think, was about two tons down in Florida. They just keep adding sticks and sticks, and the nest just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then we got the hummingbird, which has a little nest about this big. So as you can see, the size variation goes uh, quite, quite, quite big. Um, then material-wise, depending on what species of bird we're talking about, we have some that use silk from spider webs. We have ones that use lichens from trees. We have ones that use mud. Uh, sticks, uh, grasses. Sometimes as you look at this nest, it's even got human material. A lot of our house sparrows, starlings, will even use cigarette butts as uh, some of their nesting material. So it will show you that some species are very adaptable of what's available to them. So, uh, and also keep in mind that nests don't always have to be up in the trees. We have some like killdeer who nests on the ground. Woodcocks are also nests on the ground. We'll definitely do another episode gets more in the specifics of different kinds of bird nests that are out there. But just wanted to show you that again, these are considered wildlife tracks. So it's pretty cool that a lot of us can see this in our windows, up in our trees on our property. So you don't have to travel far to see these amazing tracks. We have feathers. Feathers are a type of wildlife track that we can find again, just about anywhere we, we go. If you think about it, birds and mammals, what they have in common is they get rid of their old, rather fur or feathers, and then replace new. They have to do it, especially for birds, because if they don't replace their uh, their old feathers, uh, they can't do the jobs. Help with flying, help with keeping warm, keeping dry. And you know how you have a pet at home, you know how when the, you pet them all over, a cat or dog, and fur just flies everywhere. Well, think about it. That is the type of animal track that you have in your own household. Uh, same thing with these feathers. And uh, so the feather, uh, the bird did not die for the most part. Now, yes, you may, you could find a carcass or so, but we'll talk about that later on. But this feather molted its feather and left it behind. Now, I do want to show you a, probably a cool feather here in Marion County is this. And you're like, that, is, that doesn't look like a feather. 
And if you feel it, it doesn't feel like a feather, but it is. This is actually belongs to the wild turkey. This is a beard. I know when you think beard, you think what's on my face, but this is usually on their chest. And it's just basically a modified feather it's that wild turkeys have. So typically toms or males will have this to display against females that, hey, he's, he's a good boyfriend, he'll produce good young, and tells other males, stay away, I'm bigger, I'm better, you know, don't, don't compete against me. So, so it is very important during the uh, mating ritual. And uh, we could be talking also in other episodes just about feathers alone. Feathers are always really interesting, just all the functions and the things that they can do. Now, one thing I do want to note uh, for the feathers and also the bird's nest that we talked earlier on, that uh, please, please uh, just leave them there uh, for legal reasons. Uh, only teachers, naturalists, uh, those who work like at OSU, uh, rehab facilities like the Ohio Bird Sanctuary, uh, we have to apply for a permit to obtain nests, feathers, any type of bird part. Um, if it's a game species like turkey or waterfowl and you, you hunt it legally, yes, you are allowed to have that. But, but again, if you found a robin's feather, a robin's nest, you have to keep it um, where it is. Uh, it again, it is against the law. We don't want anybody to get in trouble, especially if we're having fun and education. All right, so what you're looking at are some wildlife tracks that unfortunately the animal passed away. So we can kind of call this carcasses, um, bones, uh, whatever you like. So this animals either died from natural ways or man-made, who, who knows, who knows. So um, skulls are pretty cool. Skulls can tell us all sorts of things about this animal. How did it live, which maybe of the senses did it use the most, hearing, smell, sight, uh, things like that. And we'll definitely be talking about that in future videos. But just overall, it just shows us, hey, this animal was here. And most of the time, you will find its bones, its remains. So this right here is a, a domestic sheep, and this is a domestic dog. And uh, these uh, these animals, when they passed away, they left the rest of their, their bodies uh, behind. So... Another example is this, a turtle shell. I found this when I was hiking down in the state of Kentucky, and uh, I came upon this shell. I actually came upon several shells in different areas, uh, but this one still, it was just freshly, uh, must freshly died. Uh, the, the color was still intact. I put a primer on it, helped preserve its color, uh, but obviously told me that a box turtle was here. Uh, but I have a little turtle joke for you. So if you find a turtle without a shell, is it naked or is it homeless? Any guesses? Ah, uh, it's neither. It's dead. Because actually what's inside is the backbone. So it's like you guys. So just a little, little turtle, I know, a little sick turtle uh, joke. All right. But again, tells us box turtle. And then here's another uh, wildlife track. Uh, a lady brought this in to me uh, about a year or so ago uh, during the monarch migration. Um, a lot of monarchs don't make it to their destination, and even if they do make it to their destination, um, you know, unfortunately, they, they do pass away. You know, they don't last uh, forever. Um, but again, it would show that, hey, a monarch butterfly has been here. So again, when they die and they leave their bodies behind, this can be a great sign of a wildlife track that you can find. So what I have in my hand, ladies and gentlemen, is just snake skin. So some of our organisms have the ability to shed off the old and out with the new. Um, a lot of our insects, spiders, crayfish species have the ability to molt their, their skins or the ectoskeletons. And you think, oh, oh that poor little critter died. Well, again, it's, it's, it's basically its old skin that was left behind. And snakes are, are a great example of that kind of as well as they are growing they have to get rid of that old skin and as they're pushing it out they leave their skin behind so they could tell me that hey a snake has been here so another great example of a wildlife track what are you looking at now and you're like oh that's gross it's poop say like, oh ah it's fake <laughs> oh it fools people all the time so another name for poop is called scat. And uh, scat is actually a really cool track. Now you say, oh, it smells. Well, sure it can. 
but it's very important not just for wildlife trackers but it's also important for wildlife managers because obviously what's in this gap well what did it eat and if you're going to reintroduce a species obviously you have to know well what does that animal eat and once you find that out then you have to ask yourself well does this area rather land or water does it support the food source that this organism needs there are people that actually do study scat. Uh, they are uh, called a scatologist. So I always laugh and say that must be a crappy job. Oh, oh I know. Better stick to my uh, day job. So, uh, but just like paw prints and hoof prints, scats are a really great example of uh, tracks that wildlife uh, leave behind. And uh, at the end of this video, you're going to see my wonderful rap skills um, called the scat song. The kids love it, and the parents always thank me later for it, so uh, hopefully you'll enjoy that. Make sure to uh, watch towards the end, probably around the credit scene. So. Now that I have shown you some examples of some different wildlife tracks that you can find, we're actually going to go exploring out in the Teradice Nature Preserve and just observe some real wildlife tracks that you can find. So yes, I know some of it, uh, what I showed you earlier was real, but some of it was fake. So it just give you an idea or a concept of different types of wildlife tracks. So let's go. All right, so now you're looking at some deer tracks. And uh, if you keep seeing there's more and more and more, next thing you know it, we have a nice deer trail. Nice track that we can see. All right. So now we're looking at some woodpecker holes. So woodpeckers make holes for two reasons. Either A, to find food, or B, to make a temporary nest or home for them. So, um, they need nice dead trees or dying trees. Uh, a lot of the uh, softwoods like pines, uh, even though they're still living, woodpeckers will still use them, sometimes maples um, as well. Uh, but sometimes your hardier oaks, they usually have to be really old, decaying um, for uh, woodpeckers to make good size holes. So, um, but yeah, uh, this shows us a, a woodpecker spin here. And then if you are right at the trailhead of the Teradice Nature Preserve, you're gonna notice under the shelter house, there's all these nuts, all these hickories, there's some walnuts. And you'll notice, get a better zoom, squirrels, chipmunks, they have been feasting upon these nuts so this is a, another great wildlife track and then sometimes excuse me you look in the corners oh, you can't even see it all right guys so here's a track that you can find under the ground you probably know who this belongs to the groundhog so groundhogs are pretty cool for a lot of reasons. Uh, definitely around Groundhog Day, I know I give a lot of fun facts and trivia about uh, groundhogs. Uh, but uh, the burrow system, which I'm actually standing on, uh, can go six feet deep, 10 feet wide. And I'm actually gonna zoom out. And you're gonna notice there are a lot of holes from the groundhog. So this is a great wildlife track. And uh, not just groundhogs, because groundhogs make different rooms, are called chambers. Different kinds of wildlife will take advantage of those chambers. Uh, snakes, foxes, rabbits, chipmunks, sometimes some squirrel species. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really neat about all the different types of organisms that uh, take advantage of groundhog burrows. So... Um, actually, when I just came upon this groundhog burrow,
I hope you enjoyed the program. Hopefully you learn about all different kinds of wildlife tracks that you can find in your own yard or in your local green spaces. I could have gone on and on about all the different kinds of wildlife tracks. Maybe we could do another video in the future of more different tracks that we can find. So uh, one of my tips, I always tell people when you're doing wildlife tracking, like we talked about before, they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, also too, look everywhere, look up, look at eye level and look on the ground. As we mentioned, some of them were really big and we could see very clearly. Some of them we had to get up really close and really examine what we were really looking at. Now a lot of you may not know what kind of track it is, luckily with today's technology. Uh, Facebook has a lot of great uh, groups, um, organizations. Um, if you send it to our Marion Tallgrass Trail Facebook page, uh, I'll do my very best to try to identify uh, either by species or at least group of animal that it could uh, belong to. So have fun, be safe, but most of all, go out and explore your Marion County Parks. I'm naturalist James Anderson, and I'll see you next time on uh, Natural Lessons with me, Naturalist James Anderson. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you are about to listen to the Scat Rap Song by naturalist James Anderson from the Marion County Park District. Enjoy the rap. All right, here's the sketch song. You want to help give me a little beat? I go boop, boop, shh, boop, boop, shh. That kind of help out, and you can sing along too. So, all right. Starts with an S, ends with a T, and it comes out of you, and it comes out of me. And I know what you're thinking, but don't call it that. Be scientific and call it scat. Call it scat. All right, word. <laughs>